Hi, everybody. I'm, uh, my name is Vadim, and I'm a, a front-end designer at Metamarkets. Uh, Metamarkets is based just in Soma, and uh, uh, I actually am very lucky because I get to use D3 every single day in my job. And not only that, but uh, the stuff we make at Metamarkets, we actually use D3 for core product that we serve to customers that they pay for. So I know a lot of people like like to play with uh, play, play with D3, and a lot of people like to sort of uh, v visualize cool things and put stuff on, on blogs. But I have I have like the full excuse to really sink into D3 like uh, as much as I want because at the end of the day it, it runs our uh, revenue generating site, uh, which we by the way have a public demo for. But uh, I'll say that to the end. I don't know how long this presentation will take <coughs> because I've never done it before. Just put it together. Uh, but I'll try to walk through it. I think we've heard a lot about why D3 is great, and you can imagine that I wouldn't be here standing teaching you D3 right now if I thought it was a bit shitty. Uh, I really believe in it, but. I'm not going to go and rant about it because I don't think uh, we'll, we can say that at the end. So this presentation is actually on GitHub pages. Uh, if you have a laptop and you want to follow along, this is this is sort of interactive. Uh, this presentation is actually written in D3. It's just a web page. Why? Because it's interactive in YoDog. Uh, if, if you just uh, want to practice typing in my last name, uh, the presentation is a... Uh, v uh, slash uh, intro d3 with a capital I and a capital D. So yes, please go to the site and fork this on GitHub. If, if there's something you don't like about it, change it. For God's sake, and it's a bit of a uh, you can, the navigation is with the arrow keys, by the way. And my, my aim here is to actually show you some of the real nice basics of D3. And um, I know for some people, D3 can be challenging. Uh, it's more challenging if, if you don't know JavaScript, because it, D3 is written in JavaScript. And if you don't know JavaScript, I would really advise you to go and like read a little bit about JavaScript first. You won't regret that activity in itself. I mean, JavaScript is like, very important language now. Uh, and D3 definitely, like, uh, one of my personal favorite parts of D3 is that it really takes the full advantage from the language JavaScript and, and really derives quite cool things from that, which we'll see. So if, if you feel, by the way, that you're not following the actual code on my slides, it doesn't matter. Like, there's a very basic concept I'm going to try to relate to you. And if you get that, even if you don't understand JavaScript right now, you get this concept, you learn JavaScript, you come back, in the back of your head, you're like, oh, right, this thing, and it will all fit together. Uh, so, uh, just, <coughs> I, I know people are coming from a lot of different backgrounds, so I, uh, just as a start, some basic JavaScript-y things, um, and also how I'm going to be presenting this. So I have, I made a little slide here with some interesting uh, parts of JavaScript, and my favorite part about JavaScript in general is that uh, functions, unlike in some languages, are first-class objects. So you can have a variable that stores a reference to a function, and you can just call that variable. As you can see here, uh, I'm declaring a function called uh, squared, which is a function of x that returns x times x, and if I console log that, uh, if I just call this variable uh, with brackets that apply a function, then I get uh, I get a result which is 49. And by the way, you can feel free to like go in here and play with the code or whatever, like add six to it, uh, and it'll be squared plus six, less useful. Uh, but uh, and then the other really awesome thing that you have here is that. Um, it's just sort of to keep in mind while, while you see like the rest of the tutorial is uh, D3 adds like uh, as Joe said D3 does a lot of really cool complicated math for you and the way it does it the way you do anything in a program is with a function uh, so actually you get these these things like for example this is a linear scale that 
the scales from minus one, like that takes the, num the number range of minus one to one and translates it to zero to W, where W is 640. What is the scale, if you ask me? Like, is it some sort of weird object? Like, you might be thinking if you're coming from an object oriented at land. No, it's, it's just a function. It's cool. Uh, this guy returns a function, and then on that function, I can call properties and modify them. And at the end of the day, x, x is a function, just like the squared is a function. You can call it, uh, the, the linear scale gets called with a number and it scales it somewhere. And as you can see, x of 0 uh, is half of w, and x of uh, h, y of 3 is 960 because, because it's linear. Uh, feel free to like play with any of this code. It's all local to your computer if you're running it. Uh, that is what I want to talk about JavaScript. Now I'm going to launch into just uh, the core, the, the soul and heart of D3. So uh, D3 works on these things called selections. Everything that you really care about in D3 is your selection, where selection is just like a list of elements that you care about. Uh, and we'll see different kinds of selections and we see really cool things we can do with selections. But uh, the very, very basic and bland function, but also like a workhorse, is the select function. So let's say, in, in this example, like we have, we have an SVG. Uh, imagine somebody like just gave you an SVG with a rectangle in it. Now, you might be wondering, like, oh, how did that happen? Why did that happen? Doesn't matter. And it, it's true, you can inspect element, I'm not like lying to you. Uh, it's b better if you do it here, I don't know if I can zoom into this one. It's really just an SVG element with a rect in it. And by the way, um, I'm going to touch at the end about where to get more, like, to me, the first hurdle of learning D3, because I, I came from a JavaScript, uh, with some JavaScript knowledge, so to me, the first hurdle was actually learning SVG, and I'll, I'll point to some good tools for, for doing that. But uh, essentially, SVG is just like HTML, in, in, in the sense that you have like XML tags and of XML tags that represent something. It just happens to be in a different namespace. So coming back to this example, I have, uh, the the SVG name for a rectangle is rect, and um, somebody gave me this SVG with a rectangle in it. And here I have imagine imagine like that SVG is this is the reference the D three reference to that to that SVG object here. So I can call SVG select of rect, and then I can put it in a variable, and then now that variable my rect has a selection of just one element, that, that rectangle that you see on the screen that I put some styling to actually make it look great. Um, and maybe I don't like rectangles because uh, they're not cool and square. So I'm just gonna change its width and height uh, to be 100 so it's nice and even and square. And the way I do it is just by calling the adder, which is short for attribute. Uh, and it's something that sort of all uh, all SVG elements have their own <coughs> attributes that you can like get a list of them. So for example, for a rectangle, you have X and Y, which is their position. You have width and height, which is their dimensions. And uh, you, they also have styles, um, which uh, for rectangles, there's for example, fill. And you could set it to any style you could use in, uh, in HTML. So if I run this code, uh, the rectangle will turn steel blue and it will become a square. And you, please feel free to like experiment with these guys. Like they're, like you can select it again every time you run the code. It will just run through that program again. You can reset it and then run it, and you can see that it's changing to the updated non-square value now. Uh, so it's pretty simple. I mean, I think right now, like the concept at least, maybe JavaScript is a little tough, but sure. What's the difference between attribute and style? Like, yeah. uh, so uh, the the difference is very very like basically it's like some things are attributes, some things are styles. Deal with it. Uh, the, uh, the the more the more sort of holistic idea is that uh, attributes are something like 
the position of a thing, but styles are like the color of a thing. And styles can be actually styled through CSS, while attributes can't. Um, and there are some things which I think should be styles with our attributes, some things that are attributes not styles. And I do believe, if I actually reset this, that fill is both <coughs> a style and an attribute. Uh, I'm wrong. Um, anyhow, uh, so yeah. <laughs> There's also other, there's also properties, but uh, they're only used for if you're manipulating HTML. So uh, the, the small point here uh, that I want to make is that uh, like D3 looks very clean, and if you if you've been writing software before, you will appreciate how nicely D3 syntax looks. For example, here I have like this code that looks ugly, at least to me, because I have this variable my rec, and I keep repeating it over and over, like. I'm going to get RSI from typing it. I'm going to, somebody's going to start a conversation. I'm going to reply rectum because we're just looking at my rect. <laughs> and, uh, so you can actually write this. This is equivalent code. You can write it like this, where uh, you select the rectangle. This value now gives you uh, the selection. And then on that selection, you do just a bunch of modification. You change its attribute, you change its height, you change its fill. And, and this should be really familiar to you if you've ever used like jQuery because this is pretty much this is pretty much what jQuery that like, code looks like except instead of select you have dollar. Uh, so that's that's the convention I'm going to use from now on. Anyhow, select is boring. Select is just for selecting a single element. Uh, select isn't going to get you cool visualizations that will make you popular among your friends. Uh, in fact, if you have three elements three rectangles in that same SVG, and I ran the same code as before, uh, I just select one of them. Which one? The first one. How do you know that's the first one? You don't. It's like you inspect the SVG, it's, like, it's sort of on top, maybe they're not overlapping. Uh, it's not really what you want, and uh, yeah, you can select the second one by being like, select, uh, like, and element, etc. but, that's, like, if you're doing that, you're definitely barking up the wrong tree. Like, you're not writing for loops here. You're writing just declarative things. So, in reality, there's, an, there's a counterpart to the select element that's a select all element. Uh, select all function, sorry. And when you run it, it selects every single uh, matching shape within, like, in this case, within the SVG context. But you could, you could select, like, something within like a div or a group or, or whatever. And um, the, the re what select all returns is the same thing as what select returns. It's just a selection, which is just a list of elements, except that select is always guaranteed to return a selection with a one single element in it. And select all will return like however many. Select all can also return like a selection with no elements in it, in case you didn't bother to actually uh, like find this weird SVG that has some elements in it to start off with. So we'll, we'll come to that later. Uh, so uh, what am I doing now? Uh, before, as you can see, I, I put like, I put just constants for these things, which is cool if you just want to make everything be very much the same, but uh, that's communism and that doesn't work in that <laughs> visualization. Uh, what you actually want is usually you want to like make things like look different depending on like your data. I, I guess at the end of the day, I mean that's the whole point of the three. It's like to drive your documents with data. Uh, we haven't reached the data part yet, but you can. Uh, the point I'm trying to make here is you can put a function instead of a uh, like a constant, and D3 will evaluate it once for every element. So in this case, this function, it's called with two arguments, d and i. Uh, d is the datum, and it's currently undefined. Don't ignore it for now. I just need to put it in there because I need to get access to the second argument, i. And i is the index of that rectangle. Um, and that goes from 0 to 2, because I have three rectangles. And I can actually like comp do computations on it to position them in, the, in such a way that I like. So for example, you can see that the result here is that they're all different. They're positioned in different places and they're differently width, 
Um, so you can see that I'm still setting the x to zero. I'm setting the y to like a, to be a function of i. It's i times 90 plus 50, uh, and I'm setting the width to be i i times 150 plus 10, and then I'm setting like the height to 10. So this guy, he's the first uh, like he's i zero. So his index is zero. So this distance from the top of the screen, from the top of this, uh, from the top of this container to him is 50, and for the second guy is 140. Uh, and that's really useful. I mean, you can start doing like cool, useful stuff with this sort of already, just like by using the index to maybe, like, you could, you, if you're like a JavaScript program, like, whoa, maybe I could index into an array. Well, we'll get to it um, because. As the whole point is, like the point is to bind the data to something, and to make that d and the first argument d mean something. So uh, here, here is uh, my example again with the three three rectangles. Uh, but notice I'm doing a little, something a little different. Uh, I'm just making one extra call, and I change something around. Uh, I'm doing the same select all rectangle, and then I'm binding it. To a data. This is a, an array of three elements, uh, 64, 128, and 256, just uh, really random numbers I thought of. Uh, that, uh, and you can see that for the width now, instead of using some function of i, uh, technically I guess this could be expressed as a function of i, because these are shittily random numbers, but uh, like, I, I mean, instead I'm using the, the the D here, and I can run this, and and now these guys, this D, it's it's there. It's like that's the width that I'm showing. If you see, you can just see by eye that the second bar is about twice as big as the first one, and this four, this last one is twice as big as the the second one. And obviously, you can like this D is the datum for that element. So for the last element, it's going to be uh, 256. So I could I could say something like uh, uh, like I, I could like perform some operation and like add an offset that would actually be bad visualization practice for like making a new bar chart. Or I could uh, I don't know uh, I could for example math square rooted and then run it and everything would be tiny and then I'll like multiply it by something. And and everything will be bigger, uh, too bigger, uh, and yeah. So I I please play with this and this this data is interesting. Uh, as you can see, like I cheated a little bit. Like I the number of datums I put in here is exactly the same as the number of rectangles I happen to have on my screen already. <coughs> um, we'll, we'll maybe revisit that later. Maybe not. Whatever. Um, so, but even data is not a variable there. It's actually natural. Uh, the attribute is a parameter. Like, how does data become data? The the data. So the data gets when you call data at this point, it gets bound to the selection and infused into the rectangles. And then whenever any of these functions are called, you take this infused data. Like I like to think of it as the data being like the soul of the rectangle, and the, and the rectangle itself being like the body. So like you you put like the little like before, like like before the previous slide, like they're just like hell spawns. They're just like <laughs> unbounded to anything. They don't care. They just they don't do anything. But then you do data, and now they actually represent something, something maybe meaningful, maybe like a mortgage price or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Hi there. I'm just curious, where does D and I come from? You just, I think you were just saying it. Can you say what D and I specifically yeah. become? Uh, so when uh, the, the the arguments apply to this attribute function could either be a constant, in which case it's just that, or it could be a function that will be called with two arguments, D being the datum for that particular rectangle, which we infused in this step. And then i being its index, so it, it's just starting from zero, one, two, three. Uh, but they're arbitrary. I think I could do that. 
What, the data? The data. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Sorry, just, these are just parameters in a function. Thank you, that's a great point. I could call this uh, data, and uh, I could call this data right here. Uh, it, it doesn't matter at all. It's like it's bound within that, that function. Like whatever name you choose, it's fine. You can call I index if you're more verbose and D datum. But I'm choosing to use this index because that's what I use and that's what every single example that Mike has ever made uses. So, uh, so to give you accustomed to how things will look. But you're definitely more than welcome to use whatever uh, names that you want. So. Um, as you remember, in the, in the previous slide, uh, I, I cheated a little bit because I had exactly the same number of... Yeah, sorry? Sorry, uh, maybe you touched upon this a little bit, but is it necessary that the function has two parameters or it could be... I think that's what the question was like, getting at, that not the variable name, but does it have to have these two parameters of data and the index? Oh, uh, yeah, great. Good, great, great question. Can you have uh, no parameter? Yeah, you can, you can have a function with no parameter. Like, uh, if, in JavaScript, if you call a function with two parameters, but the function only takes like one parameter, it will just ignore this, the second parameter. Mm -hmm. if, you call a, if you give it a function with no parameters, it will try to call you with, like, D3 will call you with the two parameters, but if you don't have names for them, you will just uh, ignore them. So in this particular example, uh, I, I, can, I can raise this I and it will, it will work just as well, uh, but uh, and if you have a function with no parameters, maybe maybe that's useful as well. Like there's the many advanced uses you could make with this. Um, and then um, so yeah, as I was saying, I cheated previously a little bit. By the way, just a point of note: um, I'm doing this weird thing. I'm I'm actually going to call like I'm not going to chain everything in this like long block of dots. I'm, just, I'm actually going to assign a name to this binding right here. I'm going to select all my rectangles, I'm going to give them some data, and I'm going to call that a selection. And then I'm going to just use that variable selection and, and set stuff directly on it. We'll see why I do this in a bit, but right now it's not strictly necessary. Uh, so this is essentially the previous example, except I, I use the selection variable, and I have this like extra data here, like the 71. Well, if I run this, the output will be like exactly the same as the first example. You just you, you morph these three three like uh, rectangles, and their width would be 64, 128, and 256. Uh, and that 71 sort of just like gets ignored by the way, the wayside. Like there's no room for him. Uh, there's uh, no musical chair left, uh, which is. Which is sad. I mean, we just lost that number. <laughs> That's like horrific. Uh, send a search party. Well, actually, uh, the cool thing that D3 does, like, and this is, this is right here, like the core of it, is that it doesn't actually get lost. It goes to a special place called Enter. <laughs> and uh, the metaphor that, that Mike is using here is a stage. So like you can imagine like this being like your stage, like you're directing a, a show in a theater, and those are the actors that are already on the stage, and you can tell them essentially what what like data to represent, what like roles to play. But then if you have like suddenly you have like the script calls for more more roles, like you're not just gonna give up and go home. You're gonna just put more actors on stage. So this selection variable represents every single rectangle that, uh, like, for whom there was, the, the, the data was, like, found for it. Like, they, they matched up, and now they're happy, and they can become blue together. And this, um, this enter is the misfit data that <coughs> didn't have any rectangles for them to, to attach to. But, uh, alas, it all isn't lost, because, like, the traditional thing you do in D3 is you do, oh, all of you guys, all of you datas that, all of you datas that didn't have a rectangle to start off with, boom, now you have a rectangle. <laughs> we just made your rectangle, it's that easy. Rectangles for everybody. <laughs> uh, and this goes into the enter selection, and now this rectangle is, is the rectangle like 
when you call enter, you create that rectangle. Uh, when you call append rect, you create that rectangle. And now <coughs> you can actually set like attributes on it individually. And if I run this, there he is. He's not he's not doing what like he should be doing. He's like doing his, his own thing. But that's sort of what I what I what I said. It's like let's just put it somewhere. Uh, and I just put it somewhere on the screen and I just gave him a different color so you'll see so you'll see that uh, that he actually is like going there correctly. But that's probably like I mean, if we're being serious and not just like joking about this, we probably just want like we maybe we're plotting a bar chart and we just got an extra data that we should like have in our bar chart. Uh, so a more sensible thing to do would be to, to define them by the same rules as we defined the previous, uh, the previous, the regular already existing rectangles. And if I run this, um, then now I have a bar chart of four elements, the fourth one being 71, and this all works. And, yep? What if you got rid of the second line selection? Wouldn't you enter, just grab uh, that 71 already? We just commented that one out? This guy? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's see. So, okay. so at this point, we, we matched up all the <coughs> selections correctly. That, that was a great point, thank you very much. Yeah. We matched up all the selections correctly, and we're like, hey, everybody who got matched, you don't have to do anything. Like, <coughs> you're cool. Uh, and a new, new guy, you go over there and become blue. Uh, so that, that might actually be something we want to do. Like, I don't know. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see soon where this might be, might be useful. What yeah. specifically is being returned by enter? By enter? Yeah. Uh, it's actually like a sort of a pseudo selection. Like I can tell you from like personal conversations I had with Mike that for the longest time he was like, should I have a dot enter dot append or should I just have dot enter rect? Because like the return value of dot enter is really like meaningless unless you call append. It's like a list of special pseudo I, I call them souls because they're just the datums without the rectangles, and you should never ever touch like the raw souls. Like that would be that would be horrible. It's it's just a, it's just an array. Yeah, you can like console log it out and, and see it. Uh, and like there's gonna be like an array with like uh, the the node element being null. But yeah, so never leave this guy hanging. Like that's not cool. Um, so actually, like, just for convenience purely, there's actually a shorthand for doing this that's actually only been introduced since D3 version, version 2, but it like revolutionizes how easy it is to code, as in like once you get started, how easy it is to code like a new visualization. And that is, uh, if you call dot .enter before updating the selection, then when, when this guy enters, after he entered, he's going to join the selection. Like, he's like, hey guys, I have a body now. Now, like, you do stuff for me. And this is purely a convenience to stop you, like, doing what I had on the previous slide, where I just essentially type the same code out twice. It saves you, like, just about five lines of code for every selection you make. And it's really convenient. Uh, and, like, you, we'll see it used in several examples, purely because I don't have that much space to play with here, so I, like, use this trick to like make it smaller. Um, and now I want to like show you like a really cool thing that we can do. For the first time in recorded D3 history, we're starting with a blank uh, SVG element. There's no rectangles there. Like you can, there's an SVG element here. It's, it's white, it's invisible, you can't see it. Uh, right click, you'll see it's like a tag. SVG is empty, nothing. Uh, and we can put, like, we can like select a rectangle in there, and we'll just get nothing. There's no rectangles. This will be like an empty list. Uh, but then we can infuse it with this data, and we give it three datas, but there's no rectangles. So naturally, all of them are going to go into the enter selection. And, uh, and then we can, for each one of them, we'll straight away append the rectangle, and then set, um, set some values here. If I run this, what actually happens is that the rectangles just pop up. And this code, I mean, 
usually when you're creating D3 visualizations or visualizations of any kind, you usually start from not having rectangles on the screen already. Uh, so this is like a very, very common pattern that you see because every single visualization has to like create something to, to visualize something else. So you see this in a lot of examples and I personally see it confusing people a lot. They're like, what the hell are you selecting? There's nothing to select. And like, why is this a rectangle? Like, can't can you select whatever? Well, yeah, you can select whatever, but it's not nice coding practice. This would actually work if I selected uh, uh, a circle or even something that doesn't exist at all. Uh, this would work the same, but it's just prettier if the rectangles match. I, I, like, I think it would be like bad coding practice if they didn't. Uh, and, and this is something that really trips people up, but there really is no reason for it. It just happens that D3 has this interesting data to, uh, to the screen infusion method. And one special piece of it is you don't have any data, any rectangles or elements on the screen yet. And you just want to create them from data. And this is how this looks. Dot data, dot enter, dot append, blah. And if I had some rectangles on the screen, as we saw from the previous example, um, uh, like here, not here, like this one. This is, like, this is exactly the same, so there are some rectangles there. So uh, if we had some rectangles on the screen, they would go into the update selection, and then they would like not change, which is not what we want. So we only want to call this if we're sure there's nothing on the screen already. Uh, and this is like, this, this usually starts every single example in D3. Uh, and we'll see it a lot. So just worth like really letting the slide burn into your face. And why is this like all? What? Why is this select all? Uh, it actually doesn't need to be, I don't think. Great question. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, yes, because because uh, the select all and like this data infusion step only works on uh, I think that, like I think there's an optimization where if you call a select, it doesn't it, it gives you like a simpler object which is uh, like not fit for it. Great question. I've never actually tried that. But I'm not sure why now. Um, and now, like the counter, the counterpart of the enter is the much easier to understand exit. Not much easier, just like probably less uh, spectacular. Uh, again, we have like three um, three rectangles on the screen, like before, but we only supply two datas. I mean, if we run this. We'll transform the two that we like matched, like before. The third rectangle, this guy, he doesn't get like a soul to play with. That's still a hell spawn. So, uh, I mean, I don't know what we're gonna do with it. Like, well, I guess we have to banish it from the screen. And that's really simple because just like we have selection.enter, we also have selection.exit, which is the, the counterpart, which is the place where all the rectangles that didn't get. Uh, a data to play with Go. And the, the usual thing you want to do on it is remove it, maybe in a spectacular manner, maybe fade out. We'll see that later. Um, and if I run the slide, you can see that that third rectangle got removed. And it's not super spectacular because everything is like animated and happening straight away, which leads me nicely to transitions. I'm not, I'm not finished. I'm not finished explaining like this whole enter and exit thing, but I just want to take a, a side step and just talk about transitions because a lot of the time that's what people think is really, really cool about D3, and also it will help us later to explain uh, the, the, the things happening as they do with enter and exit. So transition is whenever you want to move something, like it's like animation, it's when you want to move something from one place to another in a pretty fashion. And a typical example of how a transition looks is, again, we have our data, but now instead of just setting attributes on it, like, like barbarians, just go introduce and boom, here's what you should be, we're actually gonna call a transition, and we're gonna, this basically says transition these elements, and then you call duration to say how long the transition should take, and this is, this is in milliseconds, so this is actually three seconds, if you run this code, you see that the, the rectangles with 
nicely flow, it will like interpolate in a cool way to their to their new position. And there are cool advanced features to control how they're going to be interpolated there, like uh, how the easing is going to work, how they're going to snap. You can really make them do really advanced stuff. I'm not going to really touch on that because uh, that doesn't like help us understand that. It just helps us put the extra polish on already built visualizations. But just to, to reset this again, if I run a nice transition, it really shows you where they're going. You can follow them with your eye. Um, and this is, this is just with two lines of code. Like, to, to make that like, boring static snap example into this, I really had to do very little work, which is, which is kind of cool. So, uh, wow. Shit loads of code. Uh, like, we can put all of these things together, and we can say, uh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have my three rectangles. They're already there. I'm selecting them, and then I'm appending, I'm, I'm infusing them with data. In this case, I'm, I'm using more data than I need, so I'm going to have something in the under selection. I'm setting things in the under selection red, and I'm not transitioning them, just snapping them straight away onto the screen. And then for the things in my, uh, in my update selection, I'm doing a transition like before, but then I'm also I'm, I'm starting another transition just to show off really, to make them green and slightly bigger. Uh, and uh, like the delay of the second transition is perfectly coincided with the duration of the first transition. So the second transition will start exactly when the first one finishes. And then uh, the exit selection, if I have it, I will set the opacity of the element to one because because I haven't said it before, it's just undefined unless I do that. And then I'm going to transition it uh, to opacity zero and, and then remove it. The remove will remove it when the transition is finished. Um, if I run this, what happens is that, and this is worth running like many times because it's pretty. Uh, if I run this, pretty, pretty cool things happen. So what happens? I, I'm, first of all, I get, uh, oh, sorry. I lied before when I said I'm not transitioning this guy. You remember what I said before that once you call, once you start doing stuff in the regular selection, if you call enter beforehand, the enter elements they're gonna like be created. These are this is like their initial state, and then it's like sweet. Now I can go and play with the rest of my friends, which is which is this guy. So so the selection is actually gonna include all the enter rectangles. So what happens here is that. We click, and there we see the, the entering guy being created, and then you see them being all animated in a two-step animation to their, to their new, new shape, which is awesome. Like, that's cute. Um, I mean, like, there's really, like, one of the cool things about, like, playing with, with D3, as a side note, is that, like, when you do all these things, you end up, like, looking, like, you end up spending tons of time doing things you don't really need to do, just because, like, I know I don't want this transition, but I wonder how it will look. And if you ever get a bug in D3, uh, th there's a good chance, especially when you know JavaScript better, that your bug is just going to be hilariously funny on the screen, as opposed to like a uh, like, uh, linker error or something like that. Uh, but it's worth examining what happens here if I reset this to its original state. If I actually had less elements, less data than I, than I have elements, then I'll force something to go into the exit selection. One of the rectangles, I think it's this one, if I remember correctly, is going to be chopped off. But it's not going to just disappear, it's going to do it more gracefully. Where, oh, there we said, run. Where it's going to fade out. Cute. Um, so this might, this is something you might actually want to put in your regular visualization. Maybe when your data flows off, like if you have like data, if you have events flowing in, and some like get it, data gets stale and like flows out, you might want to fade it out to like show that. You maybe you want to change like this duration. Maybe you want it to like really linger in there so you can really set your goodbye to it, and then it's gonna like it's still there, it's still there. Well, eventually it will disappear. But uh, you can have tons of fun playing around with this, even, even if you're not doing anything like serious. 
and you can have tons of fun playing around this, especially if you're doing something serious. And now, like I have this like data binding to to elements, and to finally put like the bow tie on this whole core of D3. And by the way, like uh, I'm, after this, I'm just going to show cool things, but uh, like this is really what D3 is all about. If you can grasp this selection model, like you've grasped D3 pretty much. Like you know JavaScript, you know this, you're good to go. And it takes people really a long time to like understand this whole selection thing because people aren't used to it. People are used to like creating elements with a for loop. Uh, but and I see people writing like append in a for loop and it's like, no you misunderstand. Uh, but once you, if you get this it's it's all smooth sailing from here. Uh, the, the final the final part is so like uh, like again we let, let's say we started off we started off running that code from the previous slides that just made uh, made those rectangles possible. Uh, like that happened before. Like I just I can't like if I had if I spend more time on this I'll put like two run buttons so I could first run this guy and then this guy. But you've seen that run like a million times already. It just puts them there. But the important bit is that these blue guys, they're not hell spawns, they have souls. Their souls are 64, 128, and 256. And they're gonna hold on to those. Now, uh, right here, uh, I'm doing my selection. This is sort of similar to the previous slide, except I like trim down my transition so it can actually fit in the screen. Uh, but instead of like giving it more data, strictly more data, or strictly less data than it needs, I'm giving it actually different data. I, I bump off the 64, and instead I'm putting it on the 72. So the number of datums is still the same, three, but like, me, like you, maybe this is what I meant, but like, can you imagine that I actually just like shuffle them along? Like I only wanted three, thi three things on the screen, and I got one more thing, so I bumped off the first guy. Well, what, what happens when I run this is that they all like cheerfully transition to be their new data. So they were at their whatever level they were before, and you click run, and they just like, oh, like uh, the guy, this guy, this rectangle that was 64 previously, is now going to go to 128, so he's going to transition to be twice his size. There. Boom. Uh, and and that's my, that actually might be something you want, maybe. Maybe like these are like, if you can imagine this is like a slow motion of like a, uh, like a, a wave breakdown and like a music thingy that goes like, then you have like rectangles that just push to the side. Maybe this is exactly the behavior you're looking for. But imagine for a second this isn't the behavior you're looking for. You're, you, want, you want them like, you want these guys to like shift away and you want, you want the new guy to be created. So, um, so uh, imagine we, in this slide, we're starting with the same state. We just have a little bit more code, so it, I cut it out. Uh, imagine that we actually uh, like have this different data. We can supply a second argument to data, which is a function that maps the data to a string by which it should key uh, itself. What does it mean? Basically, when you supply this function, by default, if you don't supply this function, the first datum is gonna be matched to the first rectangle, the second one to the second. With this function, it's actually gonna be potentially more intelligent and match the first, like it will take the first datum, evaluate that function on it, and then find where is the, the object for which that function returns the same thing. And in JavaScript, string with a capital S is a function that converts whatever you have to a string. So a string of like the number five or the number 128 is just the string one to eight. And this is actually exactly what we want if, if we want to match these objects up by value. And when we press run, so the, this is why I introduced transitions because if, if I didn't have transitions, you couldn't see the guys move correctly, uh, and like it would look exactly the same as without transitions. But this is this is really interesting. Uh, 
I have, so these guys are bound to 64, 128, and 256. So when I put this new data, the 64 guy no longer has a, the data to play with because the data like, gets bound to the, to the person that like, has it. And, and, and this rectangle is, is still fine. That's still fine, except his index 0 is no longer index 1. And this, this, guy is still, this rectangle is still fine. But then, and the 71 is new because there is no rectangle right now on the screen that represents 71 by how we defined represents. And uh, what happens here is that I animate the enter transition. I put him initially at the start, like I put him one step ahead of this guy, like i plus one. So he appears like where this like fourth rectangle should appear. And then he will animate with the rest of them. The exit transition goes to the i minus one, like the the, the mystical minus first element, index minus first, and that's actually just going to be like here on the top of the screen, it's going to just slide off. And then together, they're going to create this potentially useful animation where you have things moving around. And this is cool, like this is, this is it, this is the, this is the slide, this is the core of D3. Like you have, you have your enter, you have your exit, you have your selection, you have like this idea that you have some things in your selection and you have some data and you're going to bind them to each other and then you're going to like update, you provide transitions to update your state. So like if you feel like you're at the point where like, okay, I'm not going to like, I'm, I'm at the limit of what I can understand right to tonight, <coughs> stop here, like put in your like earphones, go to Facebook, and listen to some Facebook music. Uh, but, uh, but right here, like, you get, um, like, this, this is it. This is, like, I, I love it. And it takes people ages to understand, like, all the con con concepts of it. Because, like, it's weird, especially if you've been programming a lot in, like, something like processing, where you have to create stuff in for loops. But if you haven't, like, done JavaScript, you have the great advantage of not being corrupted from all those faults. Uh, so uh, from here on out, like this is this is the grand slide. And I want to show some cool like sort of examples that will introduce some concepts that are like sort of secondary to all of this, but are educational in their own right. So um, a, a cool thing that we could we could do, uh, and there's several interesting like concepts I've like baked into this example. Uh, but first, I'll show you what it actually does. You click Run, it creates a whole bunch of uh, card-looking text on the screen, and then you create Run again, and like it shuffles them around. Just cute, whatever. Not impressed. Uh, but the, uh, the 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 way it works is that it, so just before before you ask, the the hearts and the clubs are just Unicode characters. Um, I'm not like using weird symbols that SVG possesses. It's just like text uh, with these values. And I create like 16 cards right here. If you don't know JavaScript, like don't even look at this code. Just imagine this code as being something that dynamically creates, not dynamically, like, just creates 16 uh, cards. Now that I look at it right now, sitting, standing up here, I probably should have just typed it out. It would have been simpler, but um, there. Um, and then I, I just sort, I, I do this, this is a, a JavaScript hack. I sort it with a random sorting function, so I just basically like shuffle them. Uh, and again, ignore this. Just imagine that these are cards, that, that this is an array of cards that gets like, the, the order gets shuffled every time I call, I, I uh, do run. And the crucial bit is I didn't start off like some newbie with cards already existing on the screen. I'm doing this hardcore with a blank SVG. So uh, why can we do it? Because usually you write you write your uh, D3 in such a way that it can handle any like situation. It's like, oh, I have these things in my selection. Cool. I have these things in my data, and I will like use this information to, to build cool things. And here, just just for um, uh, so so it's simpler. I'm actually calling the enter selection 
after the regular selection. So again, I'm selecting all the text. Oh, by the way, that's a new thing. Uh, we've been playing with rects up until now, but rects don't make very good text. Text makes really great text. So we're we're gonna play with text in this example, but essentially it's the same as a rect, except like like there's no point setting a width on the text because like SVG doesn't understand it. There's certain like shortfalls in the SVG standard that you should learn if you're gonna play with D3 and SVG, but I'll come to that later. Um, so here we select text and, and we give the data as cards and we string, we say like match the card to the like the card value, like the king of hearts. Um, and then we say like if we have an update selection, like anything that's in the update selection, transition it to its new place, basically. Like to transition it to its like place. And if we don't have an enter selection, like if we don't have anything like already existing, then it goes into the enter selection and we have append the text, we set a bunch of properties on it. By the way, notice I'm not resetting X here because it never changes. And um, I'm setting it to its like position and I'm setting its like color based on its suit and then I'm just like setting a font and whatever. And then I'm, again, as the, as the text, I'm setting a function that just maps like essentially the string to a string. It's like an identity function in this case. This is equivalent to uh, just typing fun function of d return d. This is exactly the same thing. And uh, when I run it, when I run it the first time this, this code runs, nothing exists in the SVG, so everything goes in the enter and just gets created. The second time, um, it it actually gets shuffled, and this is. This is like a sorting transition that you might want to have if you're like shuffling cards in a, like a, an SVG card game, or you might want to have it if you have, for example, uh, like a bar chart, but there's like different things by which you can sort the bars. Uh, and maybe you could sort them by like their value, or maybe you can like sort them alphabetically. And you could use this transition to go between those. Um, and you can also do like a cooler transition, uh, again, like you can change transitions together. You can have like multiple transitions on the same element. So here I'm actually, uh, when I first run it, it's just gonna create those cards without any transition like before. But in the, on any subsequent run, I'm actually going to like, I'm actually gonna put three transitions in there because I'm mega fancy. A uh, first one to just move the X attribute uh, just to the side by like, it's number mod a, which is like like uh, like like each one like gets like number zero one two three zero one two three two to seven, and then they all move to that amount times a certain amount, and then I'm gonna again do the transition which puts their y value to their correct value, and then uh, it puts their x back to thirty at the end, and all these transitions are timed in such a way that the second one starts when the first when the previous one finished. So if you run this now, uh, I do this weird like sorting thing. And like this is just this is just fun. This was fun to write. This is genuinely fun to write. I like I I didn't do other things I should have been doing. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I just put this transition in because it's like I know it's cute. You can like do really cute things, and like I think the big, the big difficulty is like you can get carried away and just like spend an hour doing this. And then you felt like you did work, so you go on Reddit, and then you like <laughs> waste your entire day. Uh, and it just another interesting thing to like sort of touch upon um, is how to draw lines in D three. Like I just want to introduce you to some like variety of D three construct. Oh, sorry. Not D3, SVG. Uh, in in SVG, if you want to draw like a connected line, you, have, you actually it's, it's called a well, it's called a path or a polyline element. They're like the same as far as you're concerned. Uh, and like I just give it some like boring style so it will actually show up. By the way, like a common pitfall is like this guy is important. If you don't put stuff, if you don't set it fill, it will like do this weird. Thing where it thinks it's a closed polygon and like fills itself. 
which is not something you want, but really make some art deco weird looking <laughs> stuff. If you have like a full graphing framework in your site, you remove that rule. It's like, whoa, that's interesting. Uh, but you run this and you get that line, and it's cool. Uh, but the way you set it, like unlike other things where we just map to like a whole bunch of elements, I'm just I'm just creating one element here, just a path, just one path, and um, and that one path can have this d attribute where this d is not is not the same as like the function d. This is like the attribute d where d stands for like data or the this is such a common attribute, you don't want to forget how to spell it, attribute. Um, and then here you just like give it like a string which is like movement commands. Move to 1010, 10, line to 20, like a logo, if you ever played that terrible game. Um, and the, the, th the thing about this is like, this, is, this isn't to show you how to draw lines, because you can easily like see how lines are drawn like in many different examples. This is to just like, give you an example of the kind of helpers D3 gives you. The beauty of D3 is that it doesn't like just auto-magically do things for you. Like it does stuff in an explicit way. And it's very easy to extend it. And you're like, when, when you get used to it, you're not really confused about what it's doing. You're just sort of rolling with it. So here, like instead of like putting those points in, in a string, which was like painful to write, I put them in a nice like JSON array, like an array of objects. And then I'm using this helper method that Mike was really like kind to like write because it's awesome. Uh, and it's basically d3.svg. D3.svg holds all the methods that are specific to SVG. And this D thing is specific to SVG, so that, that's why it lives here. Dot line, and then you set like the act, like the function that would map the data to the to the x value of it. You set the function with map data to the y value of it. Remember, this is this is not creating anything on the screen. This is just a function that D3 is making. And you can look at how the source code for this is written, and uh, like you'd be like, oh, like this isn't that big. Like I could have written it myself, but it's nice that I don't have to because because D3 takes care of it for me. Uh, and then uh, like and then you can just be like SVG append path. <coughs> And here I'm doing another cool like thing I just wanted to introduce. You could like even though I'm just I just appended the path I'm not doing the selection, this still returns a selection to me. And I can still call like data with with one art like one a singleton list in it. <coughs> so here I'm just taking my list of points and I'm making it like a list. So it's like now data is going to be like a list of a list of points. And then I'm and then I just put this uh, line function here, and everything will work. And this will run correctly. And this is the same. I, I want to do this so that you can like you can set data without doing the whole fancy selection thing. But it's more of an advanced technique, and you don't use it as much. Uh, you could you could just do it. You could just call this function here yourself. And the fact that you could like do this conversion, I feel like that really shows you how like simple things in are really like, like they're really simple under the hood. Like nothing crazy is going on here. Uh, it might be like complex, like pretty high level JavaScript, but like the concepts that are being used are very simple. And the cool thing about this line is that you can also like set a, and, and it will actually give like a nice smoother curve. The why is if you actually inspect what this, what this guy is doing, if I actually take this guy, this line function, and I do console console dot log of it. Like not the, I want to convey this like idea. You see, it's just like a weird function full of like these drawing commands, and you can look up what they do, and they're not difficult, but it, it does them for you, and it's awesome. And then finally, like you like you can use the same like the same idea. You have like these two lines that one defines like a, a sine wave and one pulse wave. And, and here I'm using like these D3 helpers. Uh, and I'm just gonna create a scale. So these, these scales are like super useful. They're like probably the first helper thing you'll use in D3. And they're like also the last one you'll use before you die. Just because you'll use it till your death, but not because it cause cancer. Uh, and, 
uh, like the main, like you said that the main range, like I did in the very first slide, and then x and y now are like functions. They're not variables. They're functions that you can use to scale your data up, and then you you can put them in this line. And by the way, don't don't fret if this is like right now like started going over your head because the important bit was the selection thing. But this these are just like this is how D three looks. It's really clean. Like you get just you get a function. It's not a mystical object with tons of internal state. It's just a function that like scales things or makes you line strings like you want. And here I'm creating like we select all path dot enter, which is like a common standard. Um, and I want to just this is like pretty much all I wanted to like show about D3. I think uh, if you got the selection model, you're in a really good position now to go and start exploring this. Um, the big thing about D3 is that you need like you can do D3 on HTML. By the way, you can create really nice tables with D3 really easily. Just like like select all table row, bam, select all like uh, whatever. But uh, if you really want to do really pretty things, you want to use SVG. Uh, by the way, if you use D3 with only HTML, that that's like completely cross browser compatible. It's only SVG that doesn't run on like the older IEs. Um, but like, how do you learn about SVG? SVG is like this weird standard. And actually, when I was learning, I looked online. There was like very few resources. Well, I can recommend two things. One is this book that. Uh, that's a picture of a book, that's not the book itself. But uh, like I have that book and it's awesome. It, like I read it cover to cover and then I put it down and I was like, I'm ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then imagine me doing that while not moving like in a montage type way. It wasn't like that, but that's how I like to think about it. Uh, and then uh, you can go to any example online, like go to the D3 examples, download the D3 examples, and you can just right click, inspect element, and you see the SVG structure underneath. And that's like a major, major selling point of D3 for me. Because uh, a lot of the libraries, like the way they actually draw things, like Raphael, for example, is a great library. It's like the whole point of it is to be across the browser, so on older IEs it will like defer to like older technologies, and on newer like Chrome it would like use SVG. But the way it maps like its own like rectangle construct to the rect is is in its own little way. And you you if you inspect element on the Raphael thing, like it's unpredictable what it's gonna give you. Like you don't know what class will be on it. With D3 you have like exact control over, over everything. You could like right click it, you could just see, oh like shit, my SVG looks inefficient. I bet I can clean it up. Like I'm setting like all these classes that I don't need to. Or you could be like, a lot of the thing, a, a mistake I usually do is I forget to put like a, a space between two classes when I declare them. So instead of being like foo bar, it's like of class foo bar. And of course that's not defined in my uh, HTML and my, <coughs> so, and my CSS. And then uh, the other cool thing, because it's like raw and down to the metal, is that you can be working with a designer, and you don't have to do designs. You just do like if you're sorry, if you're a programmer, if you're a designer, imagine I'm doing it. I'm, I'm doing it from the other side of the coin. But if you're a programmer, you can just throw ugly shit that is prettily animated and have the designer like fix up the CSS and make it really nice. And that's awesome because you make something ugly but cute. And then you come back there, and it's pretty and cute. And that's <laughs> uh, I hope I hope you enjoyed it, and definitely check out the API, where there's more tutorials online uh, on the web page. Uh, so, any questions? So, I have to. Uh, yeah. Do you have any concerns regarding for JavaScript? Quick refresher on the. Uh. That's a that's a great that's a great question. Uh, I have I have some, but I can't like rattle off the names. Uh, maybe I can give you a business card at the end, and you can I can email them to you, or I can like uh, uh, post it to the list. One 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 good book is is JavaScript, uh, the good parts, but it's uber like small and hard to read, and you really have to like force yourself to get to be at it to read it. So that's uh, and but but be wary of like there's tons of crap JavaScript tutorials out there. It's really easy to find really bad information on JavaScript. Yahoo. 
the Yahoo um, tutorials on JavaScript, um, especially Doug, Doug Crocker. Um, basically, they're brilliant, and he goes through the book of JavaScript, the good parts. Doug, Doug Crockford is the messiah of JavaScript. He was the guy who wrote that book, and he sort of like said, oh shit, guys, this is actually a pretty cool language. And everything he puts out is like solid gold. Although sometimes like a little bit like with a steep learning curve to it. But everything with that Crockford is like definitely a CYP. Thank you very much. Yeah, the second question quickly. Uh, yeah. Can you go back to your any slide where you talk about SVG? How did you initialize that uh, object? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, so to, to initialize the SVG object, I, I should have included a slide on that. But let's say you have, like, let's say you want to create an SVG straight up onto the body. You can be like D3. Select uh, body and then dot append SVG. And that, there you go. Like SVG is just a DOM element. You're not going to append SVG to like HTML. You can't put like HTML elements in SVG. You can't sound it. It's more complicated. Uh, yeah, and it's great. With the new version of D3, you don't even, I didn't even speak about namespaces because it takes care of all this for you. In all the versions, you have to bother, bother and worry about that, but uh, forget I said anything. Any more questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you have any like uh, recommendation when you're finding like large, very large sets of data? Yeah. And with the uh, D3, is there any like limitations or any best practices? Very large set of data. Uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. That's something that comes up a lot. One of the definite strong points of D3 is it can, it can work on much higher data sets. Like the only thing that will trump D3 on the web is Flash, but Flash is dying, so who cares about that? The, the interesting thing is that like, my personal rule is like 10,000 objects will look relatively snappy on everything, if you have, like, but will like, stress the browser. And like when you reach like forty thousand, then the SVG renderer itself starts to slow down. But a cheat that is like wildly employed in the SVG community, if you want to render like a, a, a huge amount of objects, make a transition with a delay that's like uh, that that's a function of the index, and then it will first create like the first element, then the second, then the third, and it will look like the elements like fill in nicely. And like you can show it to the client, and they're like, "Wow, that's really snazzy." And the trick, truth is, if you remove the transition, it would like stutter and like. <laughs> but with the transition, it looks really smooth. So, uh, like Mike has a lot of uh, examples where, like, one of the examples online is every single like postcode of the U.S. in a big map, and it's all like the chloroplast that's mapped to something. And if you transition, like in one instant transition, like the color, it will like stutter. But if you do it in like a, a cool transition, it will do it in a nice wave that sweeps across the country. And um, it will look it's kind of like a lot better. Yeah. yeah. Can you show us the syntax for loading an external data set right into that little uh, array there? Uh, how, how would you just? Into the what, what array? This guy? Yeah, your, your three data uh, records there. Like how would you load an external data set? Uh, well, oh yeah, sure. I mean, so this doesn't have to be like loaded in place. This could be like a, uh, like a... Be an Ajax function. No, it, it can't be an Ajax function. It has to be like, it has to return synchronously. But you could, you could, you could for example, like, it's not comfortable to type uh, on this one, but you can basically you can say like Ajax load, and then when that like load when you have the data in, in, in your grasp essentially, you just then plug it into this guy and, and it works. Got it. So you're going to create a variable right there. That's my data. Name. Yeah. Right. Do like a d3.json or d3.csv? Uh, uh, yeah. So yeah. the sorry. Uh, yeah, there's a. I mean, that's how that's why I use it. It's yep, they actually make it a lot easier than say like jQuery. Yeah, yeah. The, the, so there's D3 comes with some like really simple methods for just like doing a JSON call. So like basically the same as uh, 
So uh, yeah, th there's some, there's a lot of helper functions in D3, and some of them are to do like it's like the, the jQuery get. There's a similar J, like JSON D3 dot get JSON uh, in D3. So just load it in any way, and that's it. No more questions. Great. Thank you. <laughs>